Hi good people and welcome. This is the series where I play and have monologues about games. In this video I'll be covering Might and Magic 9. Might and Magic 9 was released in 2002, developed by New World Computing, published by 3DO. It is the ninth game in the Might and Magic series and also the last game in the series to be developed by New World Computing. Might and Magic 9 is a role-playing game. It provides players with a few good dungeon crawls and original character mechanics. It qualifies as being an open-world game in my book, although fans of the genre may experience frustration since the amount of content to explore freely often is earmarked main quest objectives, and dull, lifeless cities and areas are overrepresented. Before we start, I'd like to take a moment to appreciate the eccentricity in the way New World Computing likes to present themselves. Here's the flaming sword. And the cave painting of yore. Oh, this must be inspired by the sculptures of ancient Greece, perhaps. Ah, the Middle Ages. What a time. Michelangelo would be so proud. And we end up with a header, reminiscent of those title styles you met in third grade. Okay, let's move on to the actual game. We are building a party of four characters. You may choose between two paths, the path of magic and the path of might. The path of might lets you advance your characters into fighter-based classes such as assassin and gladiator. The path of magic allows you to wield the power of the likes of mages, druids, and a tremendously negative lich. We don't need this. You also get to choose between a vague set of voice types for your characters. All of mine are, well, broke. In earlier games, you had the ability to add any portrait to any class, and even reuse the same portrait. This has been removed for obvious reasons. Combat is twofold in this game. You alternate between turn-based combat and real-time. Turn-based gives you additional control to defeat harder enemies. I found myself using the real-time combat often late in the game. This was at the time when my mages turned into an overpowered squadron of machine guns. Those of the magic classes will assign one quick spell, but other spells need to be found manually in the spellbook every time. Spellcasters have loads of spells and buffs, although some of them just don't function according to the spellbook. No. As your spellcasters advance, you will sometimes cast the buffs on your entire party, and it'll last a while depending on the spell. However, when buffs are used, only the out-of-combat buffs have an active indicator. Therefore, there's no way for the player to know what combat buffs are actually in use. To top it all off, there's no information on how much time is remaining on active buffs. This information would make it easier for players to make good tactical decisions. It will also prevent the players from casting said buffs every time you're done with the fight because you're afraid that the buffs will wear out. And it certainly would have saved players a lot of time. Me. Resting is possible whenever the area is clear of enemies. Our party is fully healed upon rest, but they also risk being attacked by creatures. Leveling up is done by training. When training, you receive skill points, which can be assigned to the desired skills. Training is the most expensive thing in game, and it makes a money sound when you do it. Teachers are used to advance your character's skills further. Take the cudgel skill, for instance, which is the skill that governs the blunt trauma weapons. When becoming a master, the targets are stunned when hit. To great detriment for players, these teachers are anyone and they mingle just about anywhere. They even look the same. More precisely, the teachers are restricted to areas in a city where they can walk around freely. And the cities in which the different teachers reside are actually noted in your journal. That is where the information stops. If you do not remember the general area they are in, you are forced to walk through the city talking to everyone until you find the right teacher.
Walking around the cities doesn't have to be bad though, right? Well, it is bad in this game. The movement speed is slow and the cities are lackluster design-wise, with empty streets, lack of life and dynamics, and tons of empty and inaccessible buildings. Not to mention the walkability of these cities. Trondheim, for instance, forces the player through maze-like tunnels when there are gates right next to them. Just why? The urban areas of Might and Magic 9 killed off my creativity and soon the only thing I was interested in there was to sell items, train, and find those elusive teachers. My main hypothesis for why these cities are inducing so much disappointment is because they are of significant size and therefore they set certain expectations. I was expecting plenty of side quests, immersive sound design, and the hustle and bustle of big city life. Instead, we ended up with this arena. Every city has a few citizens, with about five different character models. Seldom do they have quests and they almost never have anything important or interesting to say. Except this one. Exactly 13 side quests exist in the game, and 8 of them are started from bar owners, Jarls and Gods. Therefore 5 quests are from citizens, with no connection to commerce or main quest. It seems that New World Computing promoted citizens into trainers in an attempt to rationalize their existence. After all, citizens have a tradition of being valuable in RPG games, be it to boost your self-esteem by telling you how great you are, or by sharing useful rumors and directions. Let's have a look at the dialogue interface. The dialogue options causes extreme confusion. You are confronted with the options of your own reply, but also the replies of your conversation partner. It's hard to wrap your head around. What happened to the new conversation system that they proudly address in the game's manual? Even for a game in a series of dragons, wizards, cyborgs and aliens, the responsibility set on our character's shoulders in the main mission still does not disappoint. With the help of Farad Dar, our party aims to unite six fragmented clans against an impending force of evil, Timur Ling. This part of the story forces us to crawl from city to city with few surprises. With every city we get to, the Jarl presents us with exactly two tasks. Apparently the trust of a Jarl has a tightly regulated cost. After uniting the six clans, the Jarls sit down for a meeting and argue over a book. This argument leads to the death of Markel, Jarl of Guberland. Although he shows up in Guberland shortly after, for no obvious reason. This is when everything you have done ruptures at the seams. It turns out that your trusty pal, Farad, actually is a traitor and a spy sent out by the very enemy himself. Come to think of it, the name Farad sounds kinda like... Fraud? Anyway, Farad convinces everyone to go without you and kills them off in an ambush. We will leave the story for now and pick it up later. Don't worry, I will give you a quick recap when we get there, and uh, don't get too excited. Like in other RPG games, this game starts out with a pretty weak party. I met most dreadful resistance in the beginning. Challenges to player will be faced with are lobber pods. They lob enemies at you and are a real pain in the ass early game because you have to hit them with ranged attacks. Skeletoids. They're so small you'll have to look down to notice them. And God, I don't want to imagine from which babies, I, I mean bodies, that these came from. Later, we encounter congregations of half-naked men, skeletons, liches, oculi, mummies and demons. There are even enemies hidden in chess pieces when the developers were feeling real creative. I found it extremely difficult to learn which tabs represent skills and which tabs represent attributes. So which one is skills? The target, arm, horseman and dice? 
or the numbers floating in space. The reason for this difficulty is in the icons that are used. To quickly get the understanding of players, icons should as a rule only contain as few elements as possible. Alternatively, text can accompany the icons as well. In the defense of the developers though, I do get that they saw these icons as something more fitting with the visual style of the game. Artistic expression is important in world building and branding, but this bad use of icons put a pause to my immersion every time. Every player will have a different association when they see these icons, based on their experience and culture. Maybe it's not so hard for you to tell the difference. In design we talk about feedback as a principle to create good experiences. Feedback is widely discussed by designer and writer Donald Norman. Feedback is usually connected to actions performed by the player. In Might and Magic 9 there's a subtle sound when you pick something up. The sound as a feedback mechanism tells us that our action was completed, but it does not provide quality information. What I want to know is, did the action succeed? And how much did I just pick up? And what did I pick up? Loot is a never-ending dopamine trip in Might and Magic 9. Every single enemy you kill drops decent weapons and gear. As you progress you will learn to tell good items from bad just by assessing their images. Better items have more embellished features and more details. There's something shiny about them. Neat also is that the bags dropped by the enemies have a rarity hierarchy and you can determine the quality of loot by looking at the bag design. This is shiny, this is shinier, and this here, my friends, is the shiniest. My first interactions with the loot interface was a disaster. There are so many elements to be used here and I was overloaded with information. There's character portraits, items, gold on the right side, items and gold on the left side, an arrow and a check mark, not to mention that the gold is picked up automatically and can't be interacted with. Ugh. Also, did I mention that once you open a chest it can never be opened again? I insist upon saying something nerdy about this loot interface. Oftentimes in older games, and Might and Magic 9 is no exception, they use an interaction design strategy called skewmorphism. This is when digital interfaces mimic their physical counterparts. Here, for instance, we are presented with an actual chest and the items mimics the content of that chest. One of the goals of skeuomorphism is to have the user or the player understand the interface based on previous experience with those real-life objects. Dear viewer, this was the final part where I geek out about design theory, I promise. All shop types will purchase any item, with exception of quest items. They have infinite amounts of gold. Nothing wrong with demand for weapons, armor and basilisk skin, I guess. Providing the shops with infinite gold is one of the ways Might & Magic decides not to regulate the power of players. But even when selling 9 million items every time you return from a dungeon, money gets scarce after training your characters 8 levels respectively. Therefore, Might & Magic 9 and life has something in common. No matter how much you seem to be getting in, you will inevitably spend it all. This game shines the brightest with its dungeons. Let's start with a design example. Take Chasm of the Dead, for instance. It has an enormous, well, chasm in the middle. Descending the chasm is difficult too, with extremely tough ghosts appearing every 5 meters or so. Later on it also features an Egyptian themed burial area with hordes of mummies and skellies that revives. It's an eclectic mix of styles to say the least. Let's elaborate on another example as well. One of the first dungeons is Beethoven. In this sewer we try to find the lost manuscripts of Ludwig van. Yeah, did you notice? Beethoven, Ludwig van, Ludwig van Beethoven. Although there's actually also beats involved here, do not ask me why. I have not the competence to solve the riddle of why they decided to use a sewer to allude to the legendary composer. The sewer dungeon is set in a signature might and magic style. It morphs from a sewer into a dungeon complex of epic proportions with a labyrinth and all sorts of enemies. 
These places are a bit empty though, but what it lacks in richness it almost makes up for in sheer grandeur, and may I say, randomness. I mean, why would you put a labyrinth under the sewer, in the city, in the first place? While navigating the dungeons, you will be using the map. It follows the player around, but you cannot manually choose where to look in the map. No zooming, no panning. It's kind of funny, because the purpose of a map in a game like this is often to plan ahead and see where to go. But when the player's location dictates the map position, you are prevented from doing that. This design flaw makes it terribly easy to get lost in cities and bigger dungeons. The map communicates nothing besides the lines which represent walkable terrain. It's like an etch-a-sketch. Structures on the map can be shops, churches or something else and you wouldn't know the difference. Even Morrowind, which is terribly harsh on the player in many aspects, has information on landmarks and places in the map UI. Finally, to end the map rant, there is no world map. To see the world, you have to consult the pause menu or the town portal spell. But the pause menu does not let you interact with the map either, and therefore it's impossible to know exactly how big the map is and where the player may roam freely. As I alluded to earlier, dungeons are paramount to the success of the player's general enjoyment. Later in the game, when the quality of dungeons degrade, the game becomes something you either want to finish in a hurry or just leave altogether. Take this puzzle from the second to last dungeon, for instance. This is genuine gameplay of me trying to figure out what this puzzle is about. It turned out that the puzzle was about nothing. I simply walked to the end. And yeah. That is actually how dark the game is with the torchlight spell enabled. This is a good time to continue where we left off with the story. Remember, we were to gather the six clowns against Tamerling. The Jarl of Guberland died, but he did not die. For Adar is a fraud, and our armies died in the Battle of Jorwick. Action! In order to revive the fallen army, which is now dead due to Farad's wit and our hero's lack of it, we plunge into water to end our lives. After doing that and reaching heaven, we can convince death into helping us. He agrees to help us revive our fallen army if we complete six dreadful trials. However, all of this reviving business was for nothing as it turns out that our heroes and the evil teamer Ling have been set up in an epic scheme by the meddler. The meddler created false destinies. In these destinies, which were written on a piece of paper, teamer Ling was convinced to fight the clans and our heroes on the other side were convinced to fight teamer Ling. When it's obvious that both of these fates contradict each other, there was really no practical reason for war anymore. Timur Ling joins our party and we end the whole game by fighting our way through one of the most forgettable dungeons in the game and pulling in a very sudden lever, and consequently, trapping the meddler for good. During these double twists and outrageous surprises, we are given the opportunity to finally kill Farad. Killing him should be an epic moment, a truthful seance of grit and skill. Okay, he's dead. I'll take that. Thank you so much. Even with the unwieldy twists and turns of the main story, I believe that there's an interesting underline here. The storyline is a satirical commentary on the classic RPG storylines that we have seen many times before. It takes the idea of uh, having fate, uh, destiny, or whatever you may call it, and inflates it to the highest possible level ultimately making a joke out of the concept of fate. This does not lift the game out of the severe state of overall mediocrity in which it stands, but it provides an inward look on the RPG stories we have heard a million times before. It's impossible not to touch upon the controversial side of Might and Magic 9, even when recording an amateurish video like this. It has an aggregated score of 55 on Metacritic, 
with 4.8 from the user base. These scores reflect the overall mood pretty well. I tried to research further to find what the critics were saying about the game. Most reviews were inaccessible 20 years later. Out of the 17 reviews, a website called Game Over was the single site where I could still find a detailed critic's opinion. The review was from the game's release in 2002, and they completely slaughtered the game, calling it bargain bin trash, graphics are awful, and the story is non-existent. Might and Magic 9 doesn't do anything right. 60%. I have to admit that I enjoyed this game when I started off. The gameplay is not new or revolutionary, but there's that sense of progression that we talked about earlier. Also, the dungeons are interesting open-world experiences early in the game. There is one important thing I will always fail to understand from my 2022 experience of playing though, and that is the experience of players who purchased this game for good money in 2002. Keep in mind that they also played without the community patch. It was buggy as hell. For me in 2022, it's incredibly difficult to plug onto the expectations that were set in place by 3DO and New World Computing before release. These most likely played a key role in disappointing the fans too. The players expected more, no doubt. I mean, what has changed since Might and Magic 6? Not much. When looking back at an old game, it's easy to quickly disregard the graphics because it's old and it's hard to determine how well those graphics performed at that time. But let's not forget that players at that time were perfectly capable of judging good and bad graphical experiences. Especially in those years when so much happened, this was the year when Zelda Wind Waker, Grand Theft Auto, Vice City and Metroid Prime came out. Not to mention that Halo, Combat Evolved and Devil May Cry was released the year before. So to conclude, New World Computing did not change the Might and Magic experience. They subtracted from it. Because New World Computing and 3DO were not inventing or delivering new experiences, they were essentially relying on the goodwill of fans. I hardly think of that as a good place to be for a company. In a technological product such as video games, there's also a constant expectation of improvement and development. Like the critic on Game Over said in 2002, wait for Morrowind to release. Thank you so much for watching, and if you made it this far, you're most likely already my biggest contributor. This was the first video of its kind, and the first video I have made. There were a million things from this game I left out, but these days there's so much great content on YouTube that I wanted to bring to the table a new look at an old game. If there were things, good or bad, you want to give feedback on, please feel free in the comment section. Once again, I want to thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you again.